I'm Robin Gagnon. And I'm Eric Gagnon, and we sell restaurants. We started the nation's largest restaurant brokerage firm, We Sell Restaurants, over a decade ago. You can find us online at WeSellRestaurants.com. We're also on your radio once a week with the leading authorities in this industry talking about subjects trending in the restaurant business. Tweet your own questions on the topic while we're on the air to our Twitter handle. It's Sell Restaurants. Or post them on our Facebook page. It's Facebook.com. We sell restaurants. If we don't get to your question, we'll definitely follow up on our social media channels. Our goal is to satisfy your appetite for acquisition, feed the need for restaurant reality, and serve up a recipe for business success. If you have any ideas or comments for the show, feel free to email me. My email is eric, E-R-I-C, at WeSellRestaurants.com. Today, we are talking etiquette. You know, in today's society, people may not know all of the unspoken rules for visiting a restaurant, but we have interviews with restaurant etiquette experts who will talk about those rules, the proper way to handle yourself while you're in a restaurant, and more. And today, our first guest is Suzanne Wynn, the award-winning author of the educational children's book, The Smart Playbook, Game-Changing Life Skills for a Modern World. Her work as a matter of and social skill expert has been featured on WCBS Radio and Fox Good Day New York. Before kids, she was an an international marketing executive in New York City. Her career and living overseas taught her the importance of knowing and using the common language of manners and social skills to be in your best. Today, she's a mom with a mission inspired to communicate social skills in a modern world to a new generation. Suzanne, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, from a chef's perspective, we have Chef Ivan Flowers. He brings 25 years of fine cuisine experience to his current restaurant, Top of the Market. Prior to becoming executive chef at that restaurant, he owned Forno's Restaurant in Sedona, Arizona, which was named a Top 25 Restaurant. He was also executive chef at a AAA Four Diamond Four Star award-winning restaurant. His passion for cooking comes from his father, who was chef and owner of a restaurant in New York, He learned from him that a good chef lets the food do the work with respect to flavor and presentation. That lesson has made him an accomplished and sought-out teacher to aspiring chefs from around the world. His food is influenced from countries around the nation. He provides himself on offering a healthy yet diverse menu, featuring organic products wherever possible. He received his AOS degree in culinary arts and restaurant management from Le Cordon Bleu, SCI Culinary Institute in 1997, While attending Le Cordon Bleu, he was a sous chef as well as a sous chef at Scottsdale Center for the Arts. In addition to his culinary education, he holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from the New York Institute of Technology. Chef Ivan, thank you for joining us today. Good morning. How are you? Great. Great. And uh, we also have a third guest today. Her name is Cynthia Roden, a trained and certified etiquette consultant through the Etiquette Leadership Institute an affiliate of the Protocol School of Washington and the Etiquette Survival Group in St. Louis Obispo, California. Ms. Roden, originally from Manhattan, New York, uh, and also New Canaan, Connecticut, spent several years as an advertising executive in New York City before relocating to Vero Beach, Florida. She continued to use her experience in marketing, client relations, and business development while working for several in-house and boutique advertising firms throughout Florida. In addition to having owned a specialty retail shop, Mrs. Roden played a central ro- role in her husband's law firm dealing with employees' relations and training. Cynthia possessed an affinity for public speaking, presenting seminars and workshops, which has been facilitated through her extensive background in theater and voice. Cynthia holds a bachelor's from Denison University in Granville, Ohio. Cynthia, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Okay, so let's just get to the heart of the matter because, you know, I want to know what everyone wants to know. If you're on the wrong end of an order or you're dissatisfied with the food, Suzanne and Cynthia, and maybe we'll start with Suzanne, how do you recommend sending food back in a polite manner? And then I'm going to ask Chef Ivan to weigh in as well. Well, I think the most important rule to remember is to always handle any any situation with your food or dining out with kindness, respect, and understanding. So if you don't like your dish, it's all about sending it back with grace and politeness. I like to start off by saying um, a little apology to the waiter. For example, say, I'm so sorry, but I think the meat is a bit undercooked for my taste. Do you think I could have it cooked a little bit more? Thank you. So just by using the apology, it makes the waiter understand that um, you feel a little bit awkward asking and you would really appreciate their help. 
So again, just being polite about it and respectful. Cynthia, would you like to add to that? Or this is pretty well said. Yes. No. Exactly. I, no. I completely agree, and I think that also it, you know, just keeping it low key, not making a big scene about it. That oh my gosh, I can't believe that you know this meat is undercooked. Just using very polite manners and keeping, you know, a, a more subtle tone when one is, uh, you know, trying to get the waiter's attention and definitely using uh, being apologetic about it. Okay, and Chef Ivan, it uh, sounds like you're in the kitchen now. Um, tell us, from your perspective, when food comes back to the kitchen, um, how do you look at it from a chef's perspective? Well, you know, as a chef, you're um, you're also on the line and you're expediting. So, for example, if you're looking at temperatures on meats or translucency on fish, you want to you want to try to catch it before it goes out, and the majority of that you do. But those that don't. Um, a medium rare to me might be a little different than it might be to a guest. And it's all about the guests. It's about their medium rare. So I do believe in being uh, polite and saying, listen, you know, I need this brought up a little bit. It comes back. And what we do is we make sure we turn it very quickly. And the server is table 16, position number two. Um, <clears throat> I'll say to the cook, how long on this? If it's going to go a few minutes, we might put a lobster bisque espresso on the table so you're not sitting without food. But it always comes down. It's not the interpretation of the chef. It's the enjoyment of the guest. And the enjoyment of the guest is cooking, um, you know, having it exactly the way uh, that they want it. And I that's love, what, you know, that's what a restaurant is. I love that line you just said. It's not the interpretation of the chef. It's the enjoyment of the guest. And uh, I think that's really what it boils down to. Um, it may be an attitude from the kitchen that it's about sure. customer service, right? Oh, it always has been, you know. For sure, and you want to come to a place where you're comfortable. Speaking of that, Ivan, uh, you know we see restaurants having, you know, from especially fine dining, you know, no substitution. This is what you have, and you know we're not going to switch. Or you see restaurants will allow you to do everything, so we see combination possible from a hundred to thousands of different combination. What what is probably a fine balance that you know to make sure that a guest has a positive experience that you you see that it's a good balance for a restaurant to be able to deliver on that, and they don't overwhelm themselves with too many complicated scenarios yeah you know i've seen restaurants where they say you know substitutions are politely declined you know <laughs> declining anything is not polite um right certainly you know i've seen restaurants where the chef believes they shouldn't have salt and pepper on the table um because their food is so perfect that god forbid you know their seasoning doesn't agree with it i don't i don't agree with any of that and my background was lucky to have been informed five-star you know french escoffier restaurants where you know, I did deal with, you know, really strong friendships coming up, but I learned technique from them. But then when I started running my own kitchens, I said, you know, there's a balance here. Now, certainly you don't want to go towards abuse where menus are changed and, you know, the modification isn't even what the original dish was. Because, you know, that gets a little ridiculous, especially when you're doing covers. But, you know, again, it's, um, it's your guest enjoying it. And what the crux of all of this is, is as a professional chef, you can never cook a dish and say, this is delicious. You have to have somebody else tell you that, and that's your guests. So if the majority of the guests are, are saying that to you, then, okay, you know that you're on the right path with flavor. Good. So, yeah, for certainly it's a balance. Um, so, Suzanne, let's change tacks a little bit and take a leap forward, because uh, this has to be the pet peeve for anyone going to a restaurant today. And that's cell phones. In fact, I just saw a story where one restaurant's offering 10% off your meal if you agree to put the cell phone down, no texting, no talking, no email checking. What are your cell phone etiquette tips? And then I want to get um, Cynthia to weigh in as well. Well, I think the golden rule for cell phones is, uh, is to always be courteous, kind, and considerate while you use your phone. And really, you really should not be using it in public um, in a place like a restaurant where people are trying to enjoy their meal and having a conversation. So my rule is always when you walk into a restaurant, put the phone on silent mode or vibration and put it away. Um, I do think it's interesting what you just mentioned. There is a growing trend that restaurants are offering a discount and they're actually putting out baskets on the table telling the diners, if you put your phone away, you will get a 5% discount. Um, So people are really just trying to encourage unplugging while you dine and enjoy the whole dining experience, which includes face-to-face conversation. 
And Cynthia, wh- where do you see that? Because I mean, you, are we talking, you know, McDonald all the way to the uh, French Escoffier restaurant, or are we, are we having different rules for different kind of uh, restaurant types? No, I, I agree. I think the courtesy needs to be extended not only in fine dining but all the way to Starbucks. I mean, people are uh, going to Starbucks to actually have some face-to-face time. We're such a technology-driven world that to actually sit and have a face-to-face conversation is something, you know, amazingly enjoyable. And to have it be interrupted by someone's cell phone conversation, you know, really takes away from that. So I think it is really important when you're going into any type of establishment, such as a, you know, a restaurant or a spa or salon, to turn those phones on vibrate. And, you know, there may be some exceptions if you are, you know, a parent and you have children at home and you want to be available for the sitter. Well, put it on vibrate, but put the phone on your lap or put it by your feet. And if the phone does ring, step outside the restaurant and take the phone call. Isn't it really a respect issue? Aren't you saying to that person that has taken the time to drive to a restaurant, uh, meet with you face-to-face and sit down that, you know what, you're just not as important as the person coming through this box attached to my arm. Yeah, exactly. You're saying, who am I really here having a meal with? Am I having dinner with you, or am I having dinner with 110 phone people that are on my contact list? It is is so much more enjoyable to sit with somebody face-to-face and not have any distractions. And so it is important to just put it away. Unless, of course, as you just mentioned, Cynthia, if you do, you know, you're out and you're concerned, your kids are home, then you might just want to have the phone on the side close by just to make sure that there's not an issue with your kids at home. I heard someone say that when they go to um, meetings at dinner or, or lunch with someone, they the phones go in the middle and whoever picks up their phone first picks up the check. I think that would train people to put it down. What do you think? Oh, I love that. Yeah, love I love that idea. idea. <laughs> and Ivan, from a ground perspective in the restaurant, what, what how do you deal with this? What, what have you seen some of your peers and colleagues do regarding cell phones right now? Um, using a cell phone while you're dining is like eating a pastrami sandwich during the art of lovemaking. <laughs> there's, 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 there's not going to be a transfer there, you know. Um, you know, if you come into a restaurant and, and you're eating and you put a blindfold on, the food doesn't taste as good. It tastes differently. Mm-hmm. If you put nose plugs in and you can't smell the food, the food doesn't taste as good. If you're on a cell phone, during a dining experience, it does exactly the same thing. It diminishes the experience, it diminishes the flavor, and it diminishes the interaction, which is what a restaurant was supposed to do. It's supposed to be restorative. So all of that goes out the window. And yet, <clears throat> not only do you see more of that with conversations on cell phones, now you're seeing all the pictures that people are taking of the food as they're dissecting it. So, um, sad times when that happens, in my opinion. And that's sort of a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because, you know, you may be having somebody working in the back of the house that you're paying a bunch of money to to get the buzz up on social media. So they're saying, oh, no, we want somebody to, you know, send out this great picture of the fabulous cocktail at the bar or the wonderful appetizer on Instagram to get more people in. And you're saying, no, not so fast, right? Yeah, you know, especially when somebody takes a really bad shot. You know, it's an amazing thing if you've ever had your picture taken, and most people are like, oh, I don't look like that, or if you hear your own voice, I don't sound like that. Well, it's like, you know, and then all of a sudden you go, wow, that's a really good shot if somebody took a good picture. Uh, A lot of time, Instagram, they don't take very good pictures, and a really, really nice dish can look completely different with the wrong angle, the wrong lighting, the wrong situation. So it's a very scary thing, and a lot of people, just because you have a phone that takes pictures, does not mean you are a photographer. So um, I'll let you fill in the rest on that one. Yeah. Sure. But that brings a good point, oh, Suzanne. For instance, um, you are there with a group of uh, friends, and you know your phone is a camera. It's, it's just, oh, so many different things nowadays, and people use, oh, let me take a picture. Let me catch this moment or something. So they're reaching for their phone to take pictures of their friends or an event or something like that. You know, b- Before it used to be a camera, you know that's for that specific reason. So how do you handle, I mean, how would be some ways to handle that in, in a professional way? Well, I mean, I... I'm still a big believer, put the phone away, (laughs) Um, you know, and then you won't be so tempted. I I just, um, I mean, you will see it all over. People do bring out their phones and especially young kids if they're sitting at restaurants and they want to take a picture um, of the occasion. I think that, I mean, 
if it's a birthday or something, and it's, it's almost like taking out a camera, I guess, if you want to do one photo, that's fine. It's when it becomes the center of attention, if you will, uh, you know, at the table and everybody's taking pictures and it's just a little bit too much. Um, that's when it gets out of hand. Yeah, and we overshare as a society anyway. It's not as if we need to see every single moment of your dinner on your Facebook page. Um, exactly. Let's switch gears a little bit over to kids, okay? Crying babies. <laughs> Cynthia, you kick this off. How do you deal with crying babies in a restaurant? What's the right etiquette for those moms and dads? And what's the right etiquette for those sitting nearby who were just desperate for that alone time as adults without the children. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, and I have to think back when my son was a child, I was always very paranoid about everyone, um, you know, being angry if my child would make the slightest whimper. But there are a lot of parents that um, don't think twice about it. And we have to think about having respect is not just, you know, having enough respect for ourselves. To respect those around us. So I think if there is a baby crying, hopefully that person is, you know, cognizant enough and will take the baby outside. Um, if not, um, if I'm a dining patron, I would definitely want to ask the maitre d'. Um, you know, it is bothering the time. I'm spending quality time with people dining and, and money on a meal. And that, you know, that the maitre d' could kindly, you know, suggest that this parent take the baby Um, you know, outside the restaurant until it quiets down. I also think, too, it depends on, you know, people have to be aware of what type of restaurant. I mean, hopefully they're not bringing infants into a fine dining. Um, If we're serving a children's menu, that might give you a little bit more leeway. Good advice. Now, what do you think, Suzanne? I agree. I mean, I, I think the being a mom can be very stressful. I have three kids, and there are times when all of a sudden, you know, your kids are not behaving the way that you want them to, and your job as a parent is really just to try to find ways to distract them, um, bring them outside if you need to, and if you had a, that crying baby that just won't stop crying, then it's really time to go home. That's I feel strongly about that as a parent. Um, when my kids were little, if I couldn't control my kids, then it was time to pay the bill and go home. And I also wouldn't choose very formal places to go to with young children. Now, Ivan, we, we saw it from the spectrum, from the Chuck E. Cheese, where they're, you know, children's all welcome. We want more children to uh, some restaurants that made national news where they said no children allowed. You know, I think the, 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 the hint that if you have a kid's menu, more likely, you know, you shouldn't bring your kids. But we're in a society where acceptance, a growing acceptance of everything, and people feel like, hey, you know what? They'll, they'll make a special, you know, chicken dish for my for my kid or something. So what do you think? Yeah, but, you know, the world is changing. It's like, you know, the horse and buggy days when, uh, you know, you had the horse and the buggy and they started distilling gasoline. Somebody along the line says, wait a second, the world is going to change in a certain way and it's not going to change back. You know, when it comes to in, in finer dining, um, usually you don't see as many uh, young children. Um, as far as crying babies, what I always did is, you know, you say, well, you know, the parents really needed a night off. Uh, maybe they couldn't find a babysitter and they wanted to bring the child in. And if it, and there are, I've, I've had experiences with babies that are just phenomenal, where if a baby starts to cry, regardless of crying, not crying, I always go over to the table and I, I, I ask if I can just grab the cheek a little bit. And I say it looks like a, a nice little fresh scallop. And I say it in French in such a way that usually if the baby's crying, he stops. <laughs> And the parents are very happy, and it it, it goes very well. Um, uh, If the baby's out of control, certainly either go home or, you know, take the baby outside until they start to calm down. If it's young children, and I've seen this with parents where, you know, it's not chicken fingers. They're actually having portions of the meal that the parents are eating. I congratulate the parents that they're not bringing them up on French fries and chicken fingers, that the they're turning them on to an oyster. They're turning them on to, you know, a certain, uh, you know, fish. And these kids are eating it. So that's the way that I've always dealt with it. But basically, as a chef on the line, when you hear that baby start to scream, your spine starts to get a little tight. And, you you know, at first you go, ah, here we go. <laughs> then you put, you know, you put some things into motion to try to minimize it. Sure. Uh, 
Suzanne, I'd like to ask you a little bit about, you know, uh, how do you signal a server? Because, I mean, that could really set the tone very early in your in your dining experience you know, in a positive or negative way, the way you're going to reach out to your server. So what are some of the prop- appropriate ways to do that? I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't... Signal the, the server? How do you signal the server properly? Oh, how to signal the server. Well, you know, I... I I've written a book about this um, for kids, and a few ideas that I have in there is just our, what I call secret signals. And I'd like to teach that you just put your little hand up and, you know, wave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's no need to yell for the waiter. I, you know, I've heard people say, waiter! <laughs> you know, just do it very discreetly. Put your hand up. But there's all sorts of little signals um, that I think are fun that you can use with the server. For example, if you're ready to order, just close your close the menu. They're watching. They know that when the menu's closed, you're ready to order. And the same, there's a signal for uh, for being done with your meal, and that's just put your fork and your knife to the side. Um, and the 420 rule, which is uh, it looks like the clock, mm-hmm. and then your waiter will know you're done. So use signals. Okay. Cynthia, what do you think? Yeah, I, I love that idea of the secret signals. I love that phrase. Uh, yes, it, it's it, they all are about the secret signals. And um, just, you know, it's, it's not when you're signaling a waiter. It's not like hailing a cab. Uh, just, you know, try to make eye contact and use your hands. And just those smaller gestures can mean so many big things. Chef, do you agree? Um, yeah, you know, if, if a server or a captain is on top of it, Ninety percent of it is with the eyes, so they'll catch your eyes. They're trained to look at your eyes. They're looking at your table, and they know when you're done. They know how long it's been. They know when to fire the next course. So a lot of times, if you need something, it's just a little smile, and your eyes come up, and they catch it. Versus somebody who's really, really bad, and you're sitting there going, "I can't remember what our server looks like because I haven't seen them in the last twenty minutes." Right, because so, that's the uh, flip side, right? Is that somebody you can't get someone's attention and your drink glass is sitting there empty? Absolutely, and you know, in the restaurant business, it's always been service, atmosphere, and food is always third, no matter how good or bad the food is. If you have bad service, if you go into a restaurant and you're made to feel uncomfortable or ignored, gold can come out on that plate, and all of a sudden it, it translates into lead. It's how you feel about how a server makes you feel about yourself when you're at the table. We had huge. Oh, sorry. I was just going to jump in there because we're just about to go to a break and tell you that we had a guest say what I thought was one of the smartest things that you can always fix bad food, but you really can't fix that bad service. And that's part of what we're talking about today as we're covering the topic of restaurant etiquette. We this is Eric and Robin Gagnon, the restaurant brokers. We are on the air every single week. This week we're talking restaurant etiquette as we satisfy your appetite for acquisition, feed the need for restaurant reality, and serve up a recipe for business success. Stay tuned, we'll be right back after this brief timeout. Okay. 